The Lord be with you. I need to introduce myself. My name is Pastor Jonathan Connor. I am your pastor. I haven't been here for a while. Uh, we've been on vacation, as you know. A delightful time to be with family. Those of you who may not know, we have family who live in Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, and Florida. So to, in order to get all of these people together, it requires a lot of uh, coordination and driving. So that was the, the summer vacation was to see family. We coordinated in Indiana with the Indiana, Illinois side. That's my side. We coordinated in Florida with Rebecca's side, who they live in Wisconsin and Florida. Uh, so a delightful time to be with family, and that's an important thing. Uh, and I'm, I'm so thankful you give us the opportunity to spend that time with family. 2,700 miles in the Silver Bullet. Now, the, those of you who don't know, that is our big 12-passenger van. Uh, and that's six kids and 2,700 miles. I know you're thinking, wow, I wish I could have been in that van. <laughs> Uh, we survived and we still came back as friends, uh, but uh, thank you for that opportunity uh, to, to be away. Uh, it's a joy to be with you today. Uh, I'm so excited to welcome a special guest today. Molly is with us today. She'll be spending some time afterwards uh, during our Bible class time sharing uh, some of her work uh, in India. We're so excited to hear you share. Uh, it's been our privilege to pray for you, and it's such a joy uh, to see you in person. So please take time to stay afterwards today and visit with Molly and offer words of encouragement and uh, hear how, how the Lord is blessing uh, the work she's doing. So thank you, Molly, for being here. Okay, other things are in your worship folder. One I want to direct your attention to, which you probably have already seen, but we have a new director teacher for our preschool. We're very excited to welcome her. Her name is Amy Blackwell. Some of you may know her. She's really excited to be able to start working with uh, Zion and kids. She seems like she's just really enthusiastic about, uh, about that opportunity. So we're so thankful for Amy. The assistant position is still open. So if that's something uh, that either you are interested in or know someone who's interested in, share that, please. So that information is both here in your bulletin, it will be in your newsletter, it's up on the door, it's on our Facebook page. If you can't find any of those things, call us, we'll show it to you, okay? Okay, one other quick thing I wanted to share with you. So um, you know you've been watching the news, and over the last several weeks there's been plenty of bad news. But today we have news to celebrate. Two things. On June 17th, the Iowa Supreme Court overturned a 2018 decision that had astonishingly declared abortion to be a constitutional right in Iowa. That killing a child in the womb was a constitutional right. That decision is now overturned. And that is something to celebrate. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, she offered these life-affirming words. I appreciate what she said. She said, today's ruling is a significant victory in our fight to protect the unborn. The Iowa Supreme Court reversed its earlier 2018 decision, which made Iowa the most abortion-friendly state in the country. Every life is sacred and should be protected, and as long as I'm governor, that is exactly what I will do. I appreciate her words. Then on Friday, June 24th, two days ago, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned Roe and Casey. That is something to celebrate. I want to share with you some words from our church body through its life ministry. Here are just a couple paragraphs. The entire article will be in your July newsletter. You'll have that by the end of the week. But I want to share just a couple paragraphs. Bear with me. Life Ministry of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod applauds the action of the U.S. Supreme Court to correct the egregious and mortal error codified in Roe v. Wade. We now encourage each state government to follow suit by passing and administering laws that protect human life. The people of the LCMS will continue to pray for the government and all in authority, that we might all live peaceful and quiet lives. That's a quote from 1 Timothy chapter 2. We rejoice that the truth of God's desire for his creation was reflected in the court's consideration and decision issued in Dobbs v. Jackson. God's word and natural law together teach that life is precious and death is the enemy of all living things. 
killing violates our being as humans and cannot be sought as a solution or option for individuals. The lie of abortion has caused immeasurable harm to our society and reinforced a utilitarian view of life at the expense of our children. God sent his son Jesus to be born as a human. His baptism, perfect life, death, and resurrection on behalf of every sinner gives eternal life to all who believe and drives Christians to love and treasure our neighbor with the same love from the Heavenly Father. Again, the full article will be in your July newsletter. You're going to have that by the end of the week. I encourage you to read it. Read the whole newsletter, but especially read that article. Now, as I said, this is a great cause for celebration, but there's also great work yet to be done. Two of the roadblocks protecting life have been removed. And now more than ever, it's important to pass good laws. Laws that will protect what God has called good, laws that will reflect and teach what God has called good. This is not a time for us to check out, but a time for us to lean in and get involved. I commend the work of Lutheran Family Service, of Lutherans for Life, of LCMS Life Ministries. I also commend the work of the family leader here in Iowa. I want to remind all of us, this should go without saying, but elections matter, platforms matter, and we should vote. We need to pay attention to platforms, and you know what? We could even consider running for office. That is a good and godly thing to do. Now, I know laws don't change people's hearts. Laws limit evil, and they teach what is good. But you've got to understand, the governing authorities are called God's servants in Scripture. They are tasked with defending what God has called good. So we need people who know what that good is and who will defend it. So, either we need to run for office or elect people who will defend what God has called good. But for now, for today, this is a cause to celebrate. Two roadblocks to protecting life have been removed. This is good news. Now, let's go ahead and turn to our opening song. <laughs>
we stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, O Lord. For in your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. you. May be seated. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Lord of all power and might, author and giver of all good things, graft into our hearts the love of your name and nourish us with all goodness that we may love and serve our neighbor. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from 1 Kings chapter 19. What happens immediately before this, this is where Elijah has his great victory over the prophets of Baal. And then, well, there's a, a reward put on his head. So he has this great victory. And then there's this threat of Elijah's life. And so he runs. And you're going to hear Elijah... The Lord asked Elijah, why are you here? Why are you not where I've called you to be? Elijah's going to think that he's the last remaining faithful uh, believer. But the Lord is going to say else, elsewise. But we begin at verse number 9. Behold, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Galatians chapter 5. We start at verse 1 and then skip ahead to verse number 13. Paul writes, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as we sing together our Alleluia and verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We begin with verse number 51. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May be seated. Kids, come on up and find a seat. Come on up. Good morning and welcome. I'm going to talk to you about the, the last thing Jesus said in our gospel kingdom about not being fit for the kingdom if we're looking back. And let me help explain that. I'm going to need a volunteer today. Who wants to be my volunteer? Ellie, you'll be my volunteer? Come on up, Ellie. Okay. Ellie, I want you to stand right here for a moment. Okay. And I need one more volunteer just to stand. Garrett, can you come over here for me? If you can just stand. See that little circle there? You stand in that circle. Okay. And I want you to face Garrett. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to now... Okay, now stay where you are and just turn your head back toward me. 
That's good. Now, you're, what you have to do, let's do it slowly. I want you to walk to Garrett, but don't look at Garrett. Look at me the whole time. Ready? See how close we get. Go ahead. I'm going to make sure you don't run anything. You're doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. Those eyes are a little curious. I can see they're, they're okay, you're doing pretty, keep going. Okay, now come back over here. You're doing, doing pretty well. Now, let's pretend I was going to have you do it, but you're going to run this time. But do you feel less confident or more confident? Less confident, right, because it, it's hard to know where you're going if you're looking over your shoulder. When you're learning to drive, if you've ever taught kids to drive or been a kid learning to drive, one of the most terrifying moments, right, is when they're merging on the interstate. You've done this, right, when you were learning? I remember doing this. I'm looking over my shoulder. I wonder, what's your hand doing? You have to learn not to, to do that, right? So what Jesus is saying is, look, in his kingdom, when we're going to be followers of Jesus, if, if for our purposes, Garrett, you're going to be our Jesus today, okay? If we're going to follow Jesus, then we can't do this. We can't look back at the things that the world offers and try to follow Jesus and look at the world. So Jesus is using the example of the plow. Now, we have to imagine a time before GPS that made this easier. But farmers, how well does it go if you're trying to get a straight row if you're looking over your shoulder the whole time? Um, maybe you're that good. But, <laughs> but, but my guess is that's not going to turn out so well. Even less so if you've got a mule and you're trying to... Okay, so the idea is you're not going to be able to follow Jesus if we're doing this. So when we follow Jesus, we have to turn our back on the ways of the world. So when Elijah had Elisha come follow him, did you see what Elisha did? Did you hear? He took his oxen and he took the yoke, that's the wooden piece that they would attach to them to, to harness them so they could drive to plow the field. He used the wood from the yoke to light the fire to, to burn, to cook the meat from the, the oxen that he sacrificed, and he gave that food to the people of the town, and they had a great big feast. Well, there's no way Elisha could keep farming because he just sold all his farm equipment. So farmers, if you took all your tractors and sold them all, you're done farming. Right, that's the idea. Elisha was done. He now was going to be a follower of, with, with Elijah and to be a prophet of the Lord. So there was no turning back. That's the idea Jesus wants us to see is we are fully fixated on Jesus, on following him and not looking back over our shoulder. So just keep that idea in your head and that's how we are followers of Jesus. We don't look over our shoulder, but we look straight ahead and follow. All right, thanks for being good listeners and we'll sing our next song.
Grace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us today through our epistle reading from Galatians chapter 5. For our time together this morning, we're going to zero in on these words. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, there's a lot there, but let's first get ourselves oriented here in Galatians. A couple things we need to appreciate up front. First, we're in the last section of Paul's letter, and Paul is writing about the spirit-transformed life. In other words, he's speaking to the sanctified, to believers in Jesus. That's important because unbelievers can't do what Paul is exhorting his hearers to do. Unbelievers, that is those not regenerated by the Spirit, they cannot walk by or in line with the Spirit because they don't have the Spirit. Those regenerated by the Spirit do have the Spirit, and they, as in you and I, have a certain calling as the sanctified of God. So, being the sanctified of God makes a certain claim on the way we live. So make sure you're hearing that. Being Christian brings certain expectations with it. And we're going to get to that in a minute, but for now let's just acknowledge that the American ideal of autonomy, of absolute independence, of self-sovereignty must yield before God's Spirit. Before we get to that, though, we also need to point out that Paul's discussion of the gospel of Jesus has preceded this section. So Paul has spent a lot of time in Galatians writing about our being justified, being made righteous or righteousfied in Jesus. And this is hugely important. In the earlier sections of his letter, Paul writes about who you are in Jesus. Paul celebrates your inclusion in this global, multi-ethnic family of God. Paul celebrates your inclusion into God's covenant Israel. He celebrates your inheritance of the kingdom of God. So before we get into the expectations for being Christian, we need to make sure we aren't thinking that these are how you become Christian. You become Christian when God's Spirit converts your will and awakens you to faith in Jesus. Okay, with those pieces in place, let's go to our text. Paul writes, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, so if you are baptized into Christ, if God's Spirit has come into your heart and awakened faith, Paul is writing to you. He says, walk by the Spirit. Now, I want you to understand that Paul isn't making a suggestion. It's an imperative in Greek. It's a command, something we must do. Now, it's not a legalistic thing. That would completely misunderstand what Paul is saying. But it's so often where we go mentally when we hear God's commands being brought to bear on our lives. We think things like, oh, that's just so legalistic. As if that frees us from needing to take those commands seriously. But here's the thing. These commands, they're for our good. These commands, they're, they're not about legalism. They're about living joyfully in line with God's Spirit. They're about human flourishing. Maybe you heard what Paul said in verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve, literally, be slaves to one another. Process that. You see what he's saying? You've been set free to be bound to one another. You've been set free to be bound to one another. 
In context, Paul's talking about being set free from circumcision, kosher food laws, and Sabbath observances. But his point is that the law of love still remains. Here's the thing. The thing that has always been and the thing that still is, God gets to define love. And do you know where he does that? Well, a great place to start would be the Ten Commandments. For our purposes, though, we simply need to acknowledge that Paul is exhorting us to live beautiful lives. Beautiful lives in line with God's Spirit. Now, how do we do that? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? How do we do that? Do you know what? It's not really that hard. It's not really a million-dollar question. We make it hard. We make it sound mysterious. as It's only something that really smart Christians can figure out or do. But deep down, I, I think we actually know better. I, I think that's actually our sinful flesh talking. If we can make ourselves believe it's too hard for us, then we don't have to feel so bad about not trying. Right? Make, make sure you're hearing that. If we can make ourselves believe that something is too hard for us, then we don't have to feel so bad about not trying. Let's do a thought experiment. Let's just shift away for a moment from walking in line with the Spirit, and let's just consider something else. Let's pretend that we wanted to become healthy people, or that we wanted to become kind people, or punctual people. Let's pretend we really wanted to be that kind of people. How could we do it? Well, don't you think we'd start by asking some very simple questions? Questions like, what would a healthy person eat? Or, what would a kind person say? Or, what would a punctual person do? Would it really be too hard to answer those questions? I mean, are the answer to those questions really esoteric or mysterious? I don't think they are. I mean, a healthy person would make a plan for eating and they'd stick to it, right? A kind person would begin by thinking of the other person's need and worth as a person and then speak to them accordingly. A punctual person would set alarms and arrange their, their time in such a way that they wouldn't steal time from another person or from their employer, for instance. Right? I mean, those aren't really that mysterious, are they? So why do you think we treat them that way? Do you think it's because they all require work? Do you think it's because they all require intention, because they all require us to do something that could be hard? Now let's return to Galatians. Is walking in line with the Spirit really that much different? I mean, does it, doesn't it require work? Doesn't it require intention? Doesn't it require habits and disciplined, or we could say discipled living? Let me give you a very simple example. Let's say you want to make worship a regular part of your life because you know that God is present and working where his word is being read and taught. Well, how would you make that happen? Well, you'd start by arranging your weekend with worship in view. I mean, it's the same way you make it to work or to school or to practice, right? That's what you do. And for Sunday morning worship, you, you would go to bed at a reasonable time on Saturday. You'd set an alarm for Sunday, right? That's what you do. Or let's say you wanted to read the Bible more. How would you do it? Well, you'd anchor it to something fixed in your life. So you'd anchor it to your morning breakfast, or to your coffee, or to your afternoon tea, or your evening bedtime routine, or you'd sync your phone to your car and listen to a chapter a day during your morning commute or e afternoon commute. No matter where you put it, it requires intention, it requires a plan. 
But here's the thing. If you're going to walk in line with the Spirit, well, then you have to know which way the Spirit is walking. Well, how might you discover that? Well, doesn't the Spirit walk in line with the Father and the Son? And hasn't the Spirit inspired a Bible that details this walking? And hasn't Jesus established a church to hear and study this Bible? So wouldn't that be a central piece to walking in line with the Spirit? Now, I want to show you something. Paul says, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I want to talk about not gratifying the desires of the flesh. There's some deep insight here, but first let's acknowledge what Paul acknowledges. The works of the flesh are obvious. <clears throat> and then Paul just rattles off this non-exhaustive list. He says, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do it, literally it's make a practice of doing, that those who make a practice of doing such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who make a practice of doing these things are not walking in line with the Spirit. Let me just unpack just, just a few of these. We don't have time to do them all. Just a few. Sexual immorality. The Greek word is porneia. I think you can hear what English word we get from it. But it refers to any sexual practice that opposes what God has called good in creation. And it is not just limited to the LGBTQ alphabet, much of which we've seen flaunted in our faces during Pride Month. Living together without marriage is also included in this. I know we don't like to hear this, but we are hypocrites in chief if we roundly condemn the sins on display throughout Pride Month and accept non-married cohabitation. Because the same thing that makes LGBTQ sins sin is the same thing that makes non-married cohabitation sin. It opposes what God has called good in creation. It says to God, we actually don't believe what you have called good is good. So we are going to define good for ourselves, a good that stems from the desires of our flesh. But the thing we need to acknowledge is that none of it is walking in line with the Spirit, no matter how good it seems to our flesh. Paul names enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. So, living at war, living in a constant state of hate and ill will toward people is not walking in line with the Spirit. Blowing up at people, yelling, throwing, pounding, threatening. These are not walking in line with the Spirit. Privately cursing someone because you believe he has a better life than you is not walking in line with the Spirit. Refusing to be generous after receiving the inconceivably generous grace of God in Jesus Christ is not walking in line with the Spirit. So for anybody walking in line with the Spirit, these works of the flesh are obvious and we should not practice them. But how? How do we do it? Let's go back to what Paul says and think a little deeper. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Let me offer a more literal translation I think might help a little bit. Paul says, but I say, by the Spirit walk, and the desires of the flesh you will not bring to completion. Literally, you will not bring to their telos, is the Greek word. So, discipling ourselves and disciplining ourselves to walk in line with the Spirit won't necessarily remove sin's temptation, but it will help us not to satisfy, not to gratify, not to give our sinful flesh what it desires. Instead, it will produce the fruit of the Spirit. Now, before we visit briefly about the fruit of the Spirit, I want us again to appreciate the habitual nature of this walking in line with the Spirit. 
Okay? This is about habiting our way into new thinking. Make sure you're following what I'm saying there. Okay? Habiting our way into rightly ordered desires. About doing certain actions over and over and over and over again so that they train us and shape us and mold us into certain kinds of people. That's what Paul's talking about. about he's talking about this, this discipline, about this discipleship. He's saying, you have choices to make every day. Being Christian affects those choices. Being Christian makes a claim on you, on your behavior, on your time, on your pleasure, on your thinking. And I know that we hear that, we start to think, that's so limiting. But as we said earlier, the thing we need to see is that it, it's actually good. It's for our good. Our sinful flesh needs to be limited. Just like our sugar intake needs to be limited, and our driving speeds need to be limited, and our time in front of screens needs to be limited. If we don't place limits on ourselves, we will destroy ourselves. Just look what the desires of the flesh where they lead. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do these, who make a practice of doing such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, is that really what you want? Because that's where throwing off limits leads. Look, we're walking in line with the Spirit leads. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Enjoying this fruit requires dying to the desires of our flesh. In other words, being Christian requires a daily death, but it brings with it an abundant life. Make sure you hear that. This is key. Being Christian requires a daily death, but it brings an abundant life. Now, this is anathema to our culture. This is so important. Please hear me now. This is the air we breathe. It's in the media we consume. It's in the speeches we hear. It is everywhere. Everything in our culture says, you need to be authentic. You need to follow your heart. You need to embrace your desires. Then you'll be the true you. Then you'll be free. How's that working out for us? What do you know about the rates of mental illness in our culture? They're skyrocketing. I read an editorial in the Wall Street Journal earlier this month that was talking about this, and there was one line in that, that article that set off sirens in my mind. The author wrote this, the more a society is dedicated to the value of equality and the more choices it offers for individual self-determination, the higher its rates of functional mental illness. In other words, the more we tell people to follow their heart, the more we tell people to embrace their desires, the more we tell people that their desires define reality, that they can be whatever they want to be, the worse off they become. Why? Because when you throw out the guardrails, when you eliminate the limits, when you lose the concept of vocation, of station in life, of roles and responsibilities, when you lose these things, things which we gain by walking in line with the Spirit, when you lose these things, you lose your mind. You become unmoored from reality, cut loose into a sea of nothingness. What people need is Jesus. What people need is the gospel. Paul goes to great lengths to detail in the first chapters of Galatians. What people need is to be crucified with Christ and to be made new in Him. 
What people need is a deep sense of vocation, of sacred calling and purpose in the stations where God has placed them. What people need is the sacred limits of God's commands that frame and shape and protect our lives. What people need is the fruit that comes from walking in line with the Spirit. Just look at it. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the fruit that comes from a daily death to our sinful desires. This is the fruit that comes from cultivating godly habits, disciplined, discipled living. And it is good. But it doesn't come from finding yourself. It comes from dying to yourself. It doesn't come from listening to your heart, but from walking with the Spirit. It doesn't come from being the authentic you, but from being the sanctified you. That's why Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to stand. And with joy and boldness we confess together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we gather our offering.
Thank you. A joy to have the choir sing, uh, giving glory to the Lord. Thank you. In our prayer today, before I have you stand, I, I wanted to point out two items. One is one of uh, sorrow and one of joy. You will see the names Al and Betty Smith. Most of you don't know Al and Betty Smith. I've had the privilege of visiting with them for the last, I mean, maybe a year maybe now. Um, members of LCMS congregation from Shaler, and they've been in Manning. Al passed away on, I think it was Thursday of this last week. Uh, very, very limited in his mobility due to congestive heart failure. But I had the privilege of bringing the sacrament to them monthly over the last year approximately and getting to visit with them in their home and uh, such a joy to be able to minister to them. And they are very grateful for the ministry of Zion, even though you don't ever see them. So I know Betty watches online lots of times, and so Betty, uh, our uh, words of comfort go to you. And just know that the reach of Zion is beyond these walls. The other is a, is a cause for celebration. You will see several names listed there. After worship today, we have three baptisms. Elijah Christensen, she will be baptized. Andrea and Caven, Andrea and Caven, Andrea is the mother and Caven the son, and they're back here somewhere. Uh, yeah, they're, they're waving at us. So three baptisms after worship today. I look forward to you getting to know these individuals more over the coming weeks and months as they get connected here at Zion. Uh, but what a joy to celebrate with these families. Let us stand to pray. Lord God, we come before you asking that you would give us grace for each day and you would enable us to walk in line with the Spirit so we would not gratify the desires of our sinful flesh, desires that lead to all kinds of hurt and destruction and discord and chaos in our lives. Help us not to desire what ultimately will destroy us, but to desire through daily habits of dying to sin and self, to desire what is good, what is right and beautiful and true. Help us walk in line with the Spirit that we might experience the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for two recent court decisions, one here in Iowa and one in our country, as two roadblocks to protecting life in the womb have been removed. We give you thanks for these decisions. And we pray that you would continue to raise up wise and discerning leaders to put protections in place for the unborn, that we may build fences around the things that are good around life from the moment of conception until the moment of natural death. Help us to appreciate the gift of life as a sacred gift and trust from you. So help us to vote for life-affirming laws and life-affirming candidates and parties. Help us to find op opportunities and ways where we can be involved in the governing process where you call the governing authorities, your servants, to defend what is good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray that you would bless Janice Munson, Pastor Johnson, Paxton Birrell, Stan Bach, Joeen Bowman, Justine Schwizo, Nancy Grimm, Jeannie Groon, Sherry Steffes, Jim Devers, Rick Spock, Jean Mankey, Lyle Munt, Tanya Jacobson, Lois Gray, Rhonda Sandinson. We ask that you would give them grace for each day and the healing that you have in store for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who grieve, especially Betty, we pray that you would comfort her as she grieves the death of her husband, Al. But give her comfort knowing that Al died in faith in Christ, and she has the promise of reunion with him and resurrection and a renewed earth. Grant all who mourn confidence in this promise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We celebrate with those who will be baptized today, Elijah and Andrea and Caven. Connect them to Christ, that they may daily now claim their baptismal identity in Christ and then give them grace to walk in line with the Spirit, to hear your word and receive your gifts in your church. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our missionaries and cross-cultural worker, Molly, we give you thanks that you have called them to serve and called them to love. And we pray your blessing to be upon them where they serve and that through them the love of Christ might be known, his gospel might be heard, and people might be saved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for law enforcement and military men and women and pray for their protection from harm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our preschool and give you thanks for our new director and pray that you would identify and bring to us an assistant. We pray for our partnership with Trinity in Manila and pray your blessing be upon it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the people of Ukraine and the Lutheran Church in Ukraine, that you might enable them to bring the love of Christ to bear in real and tangible ways and that you would bring a cessation to the violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for Iowa District West, as we gather this afternoon and evening and into Tuesday in convention, that the resolutions adopted would give glory to you and enable us to continue the work of the gospel of the kingdom. These prayers we are bold to bring before you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We joyfully continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally, because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
We stand to receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for bearing with the long-winded preacher today. I've got two weeks where I didn't preach. There's a little backlog built up. So hopefully next week we'll be evened out. All right? We sing our final song. Thank you.